Hello and welcome back to SpoilerCast, a hungry gamer's offshoot that aims to inform, entertain and educate you on one particular release from within the video game, film, television or broader geek culture universes. And on this episode, we are tackling a game that was recently released on the 18th of February of 2022, scoring 88 on Metacritic, developed by Guerrilla Games as a PlayStation 5 console exclusive. We're talking about the third person action adventure hit known as Horizon Forbidden West. And the synopsis reads, join Aloy as she braves the Forbidden West, a majestic but dangerous frontier that conceals mysterious new threats, explore distant lands, fight bigger and more awe-inspiring machines, and encounter astonishing new tribes as you return to the far future, post-apocalyptic world of Horizon. The land is dying, vicious storms and an unstoppable blight ravage the scattered remnants of humanity, whilst fearsome new machines prowl their borders. Life on Earth is hurtling towards another extinction, and no one knows why. It's up to Aloy to uncover the secrets behind these threats and restore order and balance to the world. Along the way, she must reunite with old friends, forge alliances with warring new factions, and unravel the legacy of the ancient past, all the while trying to stay one step ahead of a seemingly undefeatable new enemy. And joining myself, who is Brendan White, who I can be found at Brendan 8 on them socials, is Australia's Jono Peck. You can find him on the socials at Jono himself. Jono, welcome, my fellow Kaja Warrior. What is going on? <laughs> oh, man, it's so good to be doing this. I think you and I could be two of the biggest Horizon fans out there. I think we both gave it uh, our 2017 game of the year so it's been very anticipated to uh follow up with forbidden west and finally get a chance to chat about it after almost a month since release yeah i i pretty much mirror exactly what you say there like i i would be hard pressed to find two more dedicated fanboys of this franchise and i think deservedly so as far as our fandom goes with this ip the original now obviously the sequel with horizon forbidden west uh five years in the making uh since that yeah game of the year for us in 2017 and and as it currently stands i know we're in only in march now this is feeling very game of the year-esque for me again so uh they might repeat uh twice in the same decade for me which i'm uh very very happy about but uh yeah jp this has been a very very memorable and enjoyable experience here like as you touched on the game the game's been out for close to a month now um but it's been an absolute thrill ride and a pleasure and a journey and shout out to the legend over at sony for uh assisting us with some review keys for the game so just wanted to thank them ahead of schedule here before we start diving into the uh the nuts and bolts and junk and grifting and all the other little bits and pieces you pick up along the way here as aloy but my god jp what did you think of this game like how would you rate and define your overall experience so so listeners before jono jumps in here the way these spoiler casts work is we're going to be talking spoiler free for the next foreseeable period of time and then once we get to the end of the spoiler free section we'll give you some notice we'll have a hard cut there where if you haven't played the game and you don't want things spoiled from a narrative perspective that's where you can park it and come back once you've played. But after that, nothing is off limits. So we can go any which way and spoil all of the things after a certain period of time here. But for now, JP, keep it spoiler free. But how did you find this game? I mean, what can you say? Like, <laughs> Neither of us really wrote anything for this in the agenda because I, I just think like, how can you put it into words? It was such a great game. It's not a perfect game. It's not my favorite game ever. Um, but it's certainly, as I think about it, my favorite game that I've played since the PS5 released in late 2020. It's such a masterful use of the hardware, it feels like. You know, I'm not some kind of savant when it comes to knowing, you know, about processing and uh, <laughs> what do you mean you don't know about teraflops? Yeah, teraflops is what I was looking for. I was going to say gigaflops, so, but uh, <laughs> this isn't back to the they're, future. They're, they're baby teraflops. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, like it just seems like they perfected the use of the, you know the hardware. I know what, I don't know what it's like on PS4, but on PS5, it looks pretty. It, like I've yeah. I've watched a bit of gameplay and people sharing clips and what have you, and it still looks mm. stunning on the PS4. But yeah, jump into that PS5. 
It's best thing I've seen on a console. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big goal, but I can't even argue with you. Like, you might have preferences as far as you know um, the style. Like, you might like a more stylized game than this hyper realistic thing. But yeah, the the way that you know you go into the focus and you get these lighting effects and like the the different lights and and um, textures of the machines that you battle and the, the the way that the landscape looks throughout the different periods of the day and the fog rolling in and the sun rises like it's it's pretty common for a game like this for people to do you know the the screenshots and just to show off the terrain whether it's like a Far Cry game or a you know. Um, a, a, another like a, an Ubisoft game, Valhalla, goes to Tsushima, whatever it is. I think it's above all of those. And the you know I played it in the, I guess you'd call it the the visual mode. I can't remember exactly the terminology, but just going for the 4K, the high res. Rather, I usually go for the 60 frames in performance, but I just felt like this is a game where I wanted to see every little detail, every little butterfly, every little snowflake falling from the sky, and it just it just works so well. Um, everything just feels amazing in this game to play. Like I said, it's not perfect. The narrative isn't everything exactly that I wanted it to be. I think like games like Red Dead and Last of Us and God of War, I think like those games are probably, for me, like a tier still above Horizon Forbidden West. But for an open world, you know, those games that I mentioned, apart from Red Dead, like they're more linear um this is just so full and brimming with content and things to do and um we'll get into all the the minutiae but just overwhelmingly this was a fun game like game that i couldn't wait to get home and play a game that i would stay up too late to play and a game that my wife kind of was like okay i guess i'm not going to see you for a couple of weeks you know? <laughs> it was that it's like those only come along you know once or twice a year for me where it, nothing else like you know all the tv shows i'm watching i put them on pause like it's just it was just that kind of experience so anticipated and so much enjoyed you know so had so much enjoyment getting through it platinum did last night still got stuff to do it's that big but how about you like i, I know that you love it but let's let's hear it yeah i i love it like if if i could like think of just one word to explain this game and how I feel about this game and it would be the word special I think like uh it's gorilla at the height of its powers it feels like and as you said like this game running on a PlayStation 5 is just a feast for the senses like the the contrast of being in you know the 31st century but seeing these primitive primitive nations rising up and the lack of technology and uh, that thrown against this gorgeous, gorgeous, varied um, world as far as going through Las Vegas and San Francisco and, you know, snow-capped areas and see, like, you're in the desert, you're in the lush rainforest, you're in all these gorgeous, gorgeous surroundings and you're just constantly in awe, or at least I was constantly in awe. Like, this game for the... Uh, I've, I've put in 60-ish hours, maybe close to 70 now since since um, I put the controller down about a week or so ago. And same as what you said, like this was all I could think about the entirety <laughs> of the time until I finished this game. Like I'm usually juggling, yeah, a few other TV shows. Or I'm like, I'll have some downtime and go play something else just to switch off or, or this, that. The other is like, no, nah, it's just Forbidden West, Forbidden West, Forbidden West, Forbidden West. Like it's all I wanted to do. Like I'd go to bed thinking about where I got up to in the story and I'd wake <laughs> up and I'd... There was times I'd wake up earlier in in like a morning like a kid and like <laughs> play an hour or so before, in air quotes, work started, you know? Like I could not get enough of this game and just this fully realized, developed world. Like everything in this in this universe that Gorilla have put together, it feels like it all serves a purpose. Like you mentioned the tiny little nothing things like the snowflakes or the rainfall and even, you know, just then the voiceover work that Ashley Birch provided yeah. in those moments where she'll comment on the snowflakes and the rainfalls and the weather and the animals. Like, you know, a lot of these um, protagonists in a lot of the other games, they are sort of fairly silent unless you're interacting with NPCs and whatnot. They're not giving you an ongoing commentary as you traverse these lands and meet these new characters and creatures or machines, if you, if you want to get specific. Mm. And it's just 
a sight to behold and I love this game and yeah, it's not perfect from a, a technical standpoint. Like there was a couple of little minor gripes that we'll talk about later, but as far as the melting pot that is my emotions, this game is a perfect Brendan White game. Like it encompasses the best things I love from pop culture, you know, dinosaurs, post-apocalyptic, open world RPG games, gorgeous graphics, uh, you know, believable protagonists, believable antagonists, science fiction, a bit of Western flavor in there, a bit of action, a bit of comedy. Like it's everything I love all blended up and then poured into this disc or this digital download. And I have not been happier for like, a 60 plus hour block of time for a good long time like this this is one of my favorite games i've ever played and i'm not saying it's the best game from top to bottom you know 100 out of 100 metacritic score so don't come at me from that regard but as far as personal enjoyment and just the sheer amount of emotion that i felt happy sad laughing distraught all these things from just you know certain moments in the game I can't remember a game that has sort of put me through that ringer for that entire time. Like, yeah, The Last of Us Part Two, phenomenal storytelling. Like, it it executes a narrative from front to back better. But just as far as the narrative that's unfolding in this game over such an open world that gives you so much freedom, I think it's handled really, really expertly in that regard where there's so much to do and see, but you never really lose sight of the ultimate goal as you're doing all these little side quests and there's little bits of connective tissue from a side quest that'll reference something from the first game or something that's going on in the wider world in Forbidden West. And it's just, it's so good. And I'm so happy and (laughs) I'm excited that they've already said there's DLC on the way. And the storefront thing confuses me as far as what that's going to imply, but... I can't wait to dive back in. I haven't got the platinum yet, but I've done so much other stuff in this game. It's not funny. And I'm keen to get back in. There's just been a few other releases dropped the last week that have tied me up. But yeah, Horizon Forbidden West, JP. It's it's one of my favorite games of all time. Rose-colored glasses off. I've just thrown them away. This is just me <laughs> shooting from the hip, speaking from the heart. I love this it, game and everything it about it. sounds like you're talking about a new girlfriend or something. man. <laughs> it feels that way. Like, I, I love Aloy. I love how honest and real and flawed she is as a character. And seeing her evolve over this game where... In the first one, it was very much Aloy against the world. She's the only one that can see what's truly happening and understand the scope and the breadth. We're in this. She, she's getting her crew more involved and opening up about what's happening and, and sharing information from focuses. And she's starting to be a bit vulnerable and, and you know seeing these relationships develop instead of it always being like Aloy or the highway. It's like, yep, let's, let's see what Aaron has to say or character xy has to say and it's so great to see this real human interaction and these evolutions of relationships and yeah so this game in s in essence for the past few weeks probably has been my girlfriend because (laughs) i love it so much it treats me so nicely and i think i've been treating it nicely as well so uh hopefully we can be going steady for a long time jp sounds good sounds good let's let's get into some i guess details without spoiling anything yeah where where do you want to go I mean, like, we like to start off with just our experience, I guess, of the story and the characters, and you you just talked about Aloy. I think they did a good job of making her seem like a continuation, like a, like, from the first game, the, the way the, the events that unfolded in um, Zero Dawn very much mold who she is at the start of this game. She's mm-hmm. very, like, keeping to herself, she's kind of doing everything on her own, she doesn't want to rely on anyone. And as the world uh, reveals that there's a lot more that she can't handle by herself, she has to rely on her friends and people that she's met either in the first game or people that she comes across in this game. And I think that, that it's cool to see her change in that way. I, I didn't feel like there was like a crazy amount of character development in like the back half of this game. Um, it's like, you know, it's Aloy discovering about the world and Aloy discovering about... Um, what's what's happened through history and that's that's interesting and that's cool um it doesn't really like in the first game it was very much a discovery of who she really is and that's not there anymore so it just felt like she didn't quite get that um 
that care in this game. It's, it's more about like the people around her. Um, I don't know if you felt like that, but um, I, I get I get what you're saying. I, I like I think the the development she had was more introspective, where it was yeah she's she's letting her guard down and being more vulnerable. It wasn't more so telling more backstory about who she was because yeah we we pretty much got yeah. that very succinctly provided to us in in um, Zero Dawn, but. Yeah, like seeing this this slight time jump, you know, six months ahead from the the situation that, that unfolded in the original game. So it's not too big a uh, time jump and a, a sort of adjustment to, to the world. Like Aloy's still doing her thing and trying to still save the world, really. Just, uh, you know, being this, being this outcast that's in certain areas of the world, revered and idolized and seen almost as a god herself and then others where they despise her because she is this outcast and doesn't fit in anywhere. So yeah, she kind of, it's it, it'd be in, tough. She, she's just stuck in the middle. She comes in as like a celebrity really at the start. Everyone's calling her like the champion or, or like the, the savior or whatever they're calling her. And she's just like, my mm-hmm. name's Aloy. Like, let's just calm it down a little bit. Um, so that was, that was cool to see her like interacting with people who knew her and then slowly as you like move further west in the game um, into the Forbidden West, people either don't know her or they maybe they've heard like rumors or whispers about her. And then as your exploits in the West become more famous, it happens kind of again. People, oh, you're the redheaded, you know, Karja from out east or whatever it is. So that, it's cool to see the world unfold in that way. Um, you can't talk about the story of this game without talking about just the general world building as much as i i mentioned like i don't think the narrative of this stacks up to you know god of war the last of us goes to Tsushima. the world building itself tells such a story that can surpass what those other games can do because of the size of it uh, more and more in a similar way to like red dead where like everything is is telling you something about the world and all the little side quests and all the little things that you can discover um, all the characters that you meet in the different settlements that have, you know, different tribes that are completely different from the last one, whether it's the way that they um, appear, the way that they do face paint and, and armor, the, the, the way that they interpret the world around them, their beliefs, their spirituality, they're all different, just like, I guess, different continents of the world t- tend to have their different religions over time. And that's really, um, I, I mean, it, it could be like an interpretation of like the Native American different tribes all having their different way of seeing things. Um, but whatever they were going for, it, it makes it so fascinating to uncover. And okay, these are the people that, you know, kind of worship the machines and that they're vegetarians. And these ones are the brutal warriors and they don't get along. And then you go further out and it's like, you know, these people have a, a better grasp on, on technology or whatever it might be. Um, hopefully none of that stuff's considered spoilers, but um, it's just fascinating to see the world built out that way. And the stories that are told at that level do create a storytelling experience overall that is spectacular. Even if the na- narrative did leave me wanting, like the, the main storyline left me a bit wanting, there's so much in there to enjoy, so much depth in those side quests that um, similar to The Witcher, it's it's often in those side quests that you get some of those most memorable kind of moments. Yeah, no, nah. yeah. Just to sort of briefly add a tiny bit on top of that, because I think you explained that perfectly. Yeah, the the side quests and the the errands and just the general exploration and uncovering of things at your own pace through ruins and things. That's where a lot of the heavy lifting is done for further building out the world and, and the overall narrative and. It's great. Like a, a lot of these big open world RPGs, it feels like you're doing side quests for the sake of XP or maybe finding an item. But in this, you're getting great character and or plot advancement in just about everything you do. So everything's got a weight to it mm. and everything feels like a higher level of priority as that mainline quest is like outside of, you know, XP values and stuff. Park all that aside for a minute. But as far as the narrative um, juice you're going to get out of this orange, it's it's just as important on the side quests and the little ancillary nothings that a lot of people might skip over if they just wanted to mainline it. You're going to do yourself a disservice and, and not get the full experience and, and probably not experience just some genuine great moments from some of the side quests. There is so much great storytelling and so many great unique characters from 
all walks of life and all different types of tribes and everything else in between where you just have really good, honest, raw moments with as Aloy and, and seeing them interact and it's just the best. I love it. The storytelling yeah. on display here is very special and I couldn't be happier with with the overall story. Like obviously we'll go into specifics and spoiler centric stuff in a little while, but from a top level, high level type of description, really great. It, it combines some really cool themes, some really cool tones. It takes the the story in very interesting directions and it's exciting for the potential of this franchise mm. um, in the future. Yeah. I'll just add that like I, I there are some very cool antagonists in this game that aren't expected and i did want to know more about them i felt like they were only, they only appeared like a few times so you didn't get to know a lot about them you, you got you got to learn kind of the history of, of of them and their motivations kind of but to to know their personalities more i felt like they were a little bit underdeveloped that's kind of a, a nitpick um and that, that might speak to more about like that main narrative not hitting as hard as it could have for me. And also, there's a lot of um, reliance on talking about people who aren't alive anymore. You know, they're telling the history of yeah. people like um, Elizabeth, who, who we met in the first game through holograms and stuff. And then there's um, the people that she dealt with, the other scientists and um, business people of, of, you know, our future, but their past. And it's it's harder, to, I feel like, to get a, a sense of who they are, the ancients as they call them, just through like text logs or voice memos. So some of those those kinds of things were, were harder to um to connect with, I think. But you know, it, it can be done. We've seen games like Bioshock do really well to to kind of fill out the world just through audio logs and that kind of thing. So I, you can't completely put it on the format. Some of it comes down to the writing or the storytelling. I, I did find most like, how, how did you go with the amount of, of text logs and, and that kind of thing? I didn't read all of them. I, I find the um, the kind of futuristic past kind of less interesting than if it was just like our, our modern day and Aloy learning about what it's like to live now as we do in some post-apocalyptic yeah, games yeah it's a bit of a misstep like i think if they made them all purely audio logs it would have been a lot more easier to digest and immerse yourself in mm. because even some of the text logs either they're just written in almost like meme meta text or there's corrupted files so you get half the words and it's like yeah. and it's like i've just wasted my time circling back into the menu to read this damn thing like at least with the audio logs you can play them and keep moving through that area wherever right. you pick that up, which which I think is a, a great uh, feature and a prerequisite, I think, for any game that uses that type of way to, to sort of further narrative. But I also wished maybe, because this was, you know, 2060-ish, give or take, where a lot of this stuff was recorded, maybe they relied more on say hollow like holograms and recorded some some video on their little on their little sort of data uh disc as opposed to text you know because that would have been a cool way to to humanize a lot of those scenes yeah. instead of just reading reading this muted text you could see this character that's that's reliving this scenario or playing it out like because some of the audio logs are great like there's some some real emoting going on and you can sort of feel for the person, good, bad, or otherwise, that's that's leaving them. But yeah, if you could have a, a face attached to that, obviously it's more work for Gorilla, but mm. maybe that would have been a way to to add a little bit more impact to to all that uh, subtle world building through through those little collectibles. Because yeah. there's a lot of there's so many text logs. Yeah, and a lot of them aren't necessary. Like you just don't need them. They they might occasionally they'll give you like a, a key password or a number or something to get through a door, but usually it's just a bit of extra that you don't need. And yeah, I don't. There's just something about like it's it's futuristic for us, but it's the past for Aloy. Where like I don't have a, a touchstone for what the world's like because it's it's a sci-fi future. So yeah. when when Aloy's then trying to like interpret it, it just like throws me through this whole thing. Like, I, I like when when these futuristic these future apocalypses are, are reading about really simple things in the past, and 
how fascinating like you get you get these moments where they're like oh like listen to this heavy metal music this is what they used to listen to oh and they used to celebrate these things called um you know birthdays or halloween or whatever it is and they're like trying to understand our world and that that stuff's really fascinating to me but when it's just mm-hmm. like you know there's you get a black box out of a out of a crashed plane and they're talking about some event or technology i'm just like ah, uh-uh, this is like beyond what i know already so I'm, I'm, I'm not sinking in it's not like going in the right way yeah no i'm i'm completely completely there with you on that one as far as gameplay i think we, we've sort of touched on that like we could probably add a little bit more weight to to that after our opening salvos as far as the gameplay and if you've got some specifics you wanted to maybe dive into after yeah, broad stroking it to begin definitely with. so i think it's important to say that as good as Horizon Zero Dawn was, there was a lot of problems people had, like especially like the haters, <laughs> people that are like, "Oh, it's, you know, Breath of the Wild's better." Like you can climb anything. Okay, so <laughs> they really improved the exploration and the combat in this game. I remember people saying like the hand to hand, like the melee combat in the first game sucked, and it kind of did. I always said like you know, you know, it's it's a it's a game where you've got endless amount of ranged weapons why would you do any melee combat unless you have to but in this game they added so much depth to that there's like different combos and there's different like power-ups and different moves you can do and you really can put that whole kit together to do some pretty devastating combinations of, of attacks even against machines so you don't have to necessarily rely completely on ranged weaponry so I love that they did that. Um, they made that way more interesting. There's like a million more weapons, like not literally a million, but like figuratively, there's like a million more weapons to use in this game. They they, they at least added like three or four times the amount that the first game had and different variations of of the kind of uh, wheel of, of weapons that we, we already knew, plus a few more new ones. So I, I felt like doing that made combat feel fresh almost the whole way through Mm -hmm. the game because you'd always be picking up a new type of weapon or this one's got a different type of ammo than my previous one so i can change the combination of weapons that i have so i kind of have a bit of everything on at the at my fingertips and on top of that there's 22 new machines to fight and some of them are so amazing to come across in the in the wild for the first time you know the first time you see some of these machines is some of the the coolest moments in the game, and oh yeah, and, <laughs> and like the, the the different ways that they they attack you and the, the learning how the different ones in, interact with the environment. You know whether this one digs underground and this one shoots, you know, ice and this one throws rocks at you. Like there's so much variance that it, it just always feels like something new and. Even if it's an enemy that you've seen before, you might have a new weapon to attack it with that, that does more damage or that can exploit a weakness of theirs. Um, so I, I just felt like that side of things was a complete improvement on the first game as well as you know the introduction of you know being able to glide through the air, like taking it from being a very um, kind of planted on the ground. You could climb some rocks. You can climb almost everything in this game. And I feel like that was a reaction to the criticism from the first one. So I just feel like they improved from the first one in almost every way um, possible. The loading screens as well, they're instantaneous, which, you know, by the end of the game, when you've just loaded up on fast travel packs, you can just go zip around the map and it takes like no exaggeration, what, like three seconds, if that. Yeah. On the PS5, it was super quick. It was fantastic. Like... We, we sort of say, oh, boohoo us because there's no downtime to do a social media doom scroll or anything anymore in between, you know, deaths or, or loading or, or quick travels. But it just keeps you immersed in this world. And as you said, JP, like all the things they did great in the original, they've just improved on in some aspects tenfold. Like like the, the, the combat feels great. Like I've already mentioned the exploration where everything, it felt like it had meaning, like go to this point on the map and you're going to get rewarded. Go to that point on the map and you're going to get rewarded in some regard, not just from a possession, but just from uh, character development or, or, or story enhancement. Um, yeah, like it's the freedom that's at your fingertips in this game where 
you know, once you get through that opening, you could say intro where, where you're working your way through uh, to get, get permission to go into the, the Forbidden West. But once you're in, you can go wherever the hell you want pretty much and do whatever the hell you choose. Like there is some some um, loose handholding where it's like, you know, here's, here's the plot point you've got to go to to advance the main story. But if you go, you know what? Stick it up your bum, gorilla. I'm going north. I'm going to see what's up there. And you can do that potentially at your own peril, but you can go wherever you want, do whatever you want, fight whatever you want, which could be your downfall because <laughs> you can just stumble into certain areas where you might be level 18. And then all of a sudden there's a, a thunder jaw there that's level 45 and you're like, oh boy, this, is, uh, this isn't going to end well for me. But as you said, the, the weapons at your disposal will make you feel very powerful. It makes you feel like you're in just about every fight. Uh, you know, collectively, there's over 40 machines in total, including those 22 new. I think there's 43, maybe 44. I can't remember the exact number, but I know it's in the 40s as far as machine variety. And this game, it just feels like true next gen. Like this is this is one of those big leaps where, you know, we played and talked in depth about Cyberpunk a year or so ago and saying that that was that first step into next gen potentially, but we wanted more. This is the more. Or at least for me, this is the more and I've got it and I'm happy and I have minimal gripes as far as performance. Uh, like, yeah, the the 4K mode, the frame rates were steady, the, the vistas, the sunrises, the sunset, the weather effects, everything, like it is gorgeous no matter what time of day it is, no matter what's going on around you. It is phenomenal to play and just observe. And on the gameplay loop, stepping aside from that, this is the first game where I've really given a shit about photo mode like i can respect it and appreciate the shots that people take in all these games i think it's art but this is the first game with a photo mode that just got me like i put easy probably four hours into photo mode easy maybe more i don't know i couldn't find a separate timer to see if it had a breakdown on that in the game clock but Everywhere I'd go, I'd see certain moments and I'm like, all right, I got to frame my Aloy here and I'm going to pose her and do this or I'm going to pause mid jumping in to try and stab something with my spear, whatever it might be, and just try and make these shots. And every single time they just look stunning because the game that you're photographing around this moment is just it's beautiful and it's the best and I'm so happy. But jumping a little forward into maybe favorite abilities, weapons, and play style, you sort of mentioned that you sort of potentially avoided doing too much of the the melee combat. You were more so relying on a lot of the range weaponry that's at your disposal. Um, no, that was like in the first game. I meant um, I definitely maxed out that warrior skill tree first to get all those different combos of swinging attacks. And and then just the, the, the buffs to weapon damage, like working through that warrior skill tree... You can make that spear do massive damage. Yeah, yeah, it was, it's pretty cool to just take out a, a smaller machine just with the spear in a way that I don't think you'd ever want to do that in the first game. So they certainly made that um, more appealing. And, you know, yeah, so as, as the game went on and I felt like I had like all the weapons that I wanted to use, I tended to approach enemies like, you know, scan them, see what their weakness is. Okay, it's ice. I'll freeze them. Once they're frozen, throw an explosive spear into them and just tear them to pieces. And that always seemed to work. Um, if they had weapons like the Thunder Jaw or something like that, you know, you could do the, the tear shot bow and like knock off the, their weapons so that they either can't use them or I might get to pick it up and take a few pot shots at them. But yeah, those explosive spears were super overpowered, and I, I noticed they really towards were. The end, they really yeah, were. Like the sl- the slither fang, something like that. I'd like try and fight it using its weaknesses. I'm like, okay, I'm attacking it with ice or with acid or whatever. And then, like after dying, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna throw th- explosive spears at it, and just took it out in like two minutes or less. It was just like, why didn't I just do that before? They're, they're way overpowered, especially when you've exploited their weaknesses a little bit so um the, definitely the spike thrower was um a favorite and when you're attacking humans it's just like oh you're the chief of this rebel camp how do you like an explosive <laughs> spike in you because it'll take you yeah. out in like one and a half 
attacks basically that was always fun um <laughs> but yeah stealth's always good until you know if it doesn't work completely um but one of the things that i loved you know all the weapons are fun to use as a slingshot kind of weapon that i realized through doing like the the pit challenges that you can like charge up by catching it as it comes back to you oh the shredder gauntlet yeah, you mean yeah that one yeah, yeah not the actual it's slingshot, so fun yeah, it's like a What's that game that like South the Brazilian game where they like flick the the ball with the you know the almost like a yeah, lacrosse? Yeah, it's, it's like it's like lacrosse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that thing. Um, it's a crazy weapon. It doesn't do heaps of damage, but when you've got one that's got an effect on it, it's very um, handy. They're just so much fun to use and all different. The thing that um, is kind of impressive is that uh, there's so much to choose from that half of them I almost never really touched like the 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 traps i never used smoke bombs there seemed to be like a big emphasis on in the skill tree never used them trip wires and ropes like i tried to pin down a few big machines with ropes early in the game and didn't have like any success so i kind of just gave up on it and i rarely like corrupted a machine to have it fight on my side until like more towards the end game and they're all very legitimate techniques if if you're interested in playing that way but i just wasn't so it it just speaks to how much there is in the first game i found it overwhelming that you couldn't have all of your weapons accessible um in the weapon wheel at once you have to go into the menu and pick them but i found in this game i just more was able to get what I wanted and make sure that every- yeah you, you found your you found your hero weapons and just sort of stuck with them yeah and and I always did kind of want to make sure okay I've got a plasma attack I've got a acid I've got fire I've got ice I've got everything covered and once I had that all I needed was to have some steady supply of arrows and my spikes and that was pretty much going to do the trick yeah I'm um. I'm with you. I, I played similar to, to yourself there. Like, yeah, the, the spike thrower, fantastic addition to the game. Was it a little bit broken? Probably because, yeah, you could rain hell down on just about anything with that. And, and as you said, going through those enemy encampments, finding the chieftain as as because you you really just got to kill him. And then if you waited enough time, the the rest of his crew would just leave. I'd naturally just kill them all as well. But finding that chieftain and just, yeah, a big old explosive spike right to the chest usually has him um, has him or her close to death which which was phenomenal um I, I sort of had a fairly balanced use of the skill points like my primary focuses was around the warrior hunter and then infiltrator uh, and then machine master about probably halfway through so I typically stealth into an area you use my focus survey what's going on find those weak points target certain areas on a on a machine because I'd want that resource to level up something else naturally as you do in this game. Uh, I'd fire some arrows, eventually something would see where I was and then it was go time and I was just <laughs> running around for, for dear life trying not to get tail swiped or shot with a laser or whatever the hell this, this beast is throwing at you. But I also enjoyed about halfway through and then onwards, I really started leaning into the overriding of the machines. I went and did all the cauldrons so you get the override abilities for more machines and just sneaking into certain areas where there might be a half a dozen beasties around. You're like, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna override the biggest one here. Like one, when you can start like overriding a Thunderjaw and stuff like that and then just watching this glorified robotic T-Rex just roll in and destroy everything and you're just sitting back almost eating popcorn with <laughs> Aloy as all this disaster and death and destruction rains down. It's so good. And it just gives you a different way to go about things instead of trying to stealth your way in and kill everything without being seen. It's like, you know what? I'm just going to almost like sound a big horn that I'm here, send my big machine in first, and I'm just going to, you know, pot shot people <laughs> with the with sort of the, the sniper bow from afar or just shoot the tear arrows in and, and knock stuff off at the same time. And it's just... There's so much chaos on the screen at once in some of these moments yeah. in this game, but it never felt too overwhelming. Like there was times where I'm like, there's no way I'm going to survive this, but a well-timed explosive spike or a well-timed um, you know, shot from the blast thing gets me out of there or using just a little trip caster thing um, to either you know trip up an enemy and buy you a second or using your 
grapple hook to, you know, get get to some higher ground, breathe for a split second, maybe jump off and then stealth stab something else with your spear. Like there's so many ways to fight and survive and succeed. <clears throat> it kept it fresh the whole time. But I also did use the the traps and the smoke bombs because sometimes I bite off more than I can chew. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going in here and testing my metal. And then there'd be a dozen things on me like, all right, I got a ninja vanish here, and then run and hide in a yeah. bush for a second and catch my breath. I, I will admit that I switched the difficulty to easy. So if I had played, you cheeky bugger, I did. I did that on the first Horizon as well. Actually, it was. It's. It does get very hard though. The, so yeah. I, I, I probably would have enjoyed the game even more if I scaled it back, because some of these battles get stuffed. <laughs> That's the thing. I'm like, okay, if if I'm getting frustrated or if I'm literally taking. I don't know, half an hour to do a challenge at a hunting. It's always the hunting challenges that get me to change the difficulty. I'm like, I'm almost not having fun anymore. So I'm just going to change difficulty and feel powerful and have more fun with the game and not take as long to get through it. Because you were always ahead of me and I wanted to catch up to you so that we could do this podcast right now. So that's mm-hmm. that's one of the reasons that I mixed it up and put it on easy but anyway my point is if i was playing with a bit more challenge then i probably would have needed those traps and smoke bombs and whatnot so um it makes sense it's not yeah. a flaw of the game at all i'd say um <clears throat> those those traps and smoke bombs save my ass so many times especially with like when you're going to clear a cauldron and you get the the end boss at the cauldron all the time yeah. Knowing that it was going to be there, I'd always strategically just drop a few traps around, just kite them into them to know that it's going to do some damage and potentially, you know, be the difference between life and death. Yeah, sure. This is probably the best time, like looking at the the topics that we're going to talk about, this is probably the best time to talk about like some of those crazy encounters that we had or those moments in combat. Like, you know, I, I found often that healing was at the forefront of my mind and like you're you're rolling around an enemy it's like taking shots at you it's swiping you it's coming out from underground and attacking you everywhere you go you just can't escape them and you're getting shots off and your health is going down and down you've used all your your um all your berries berries. (laughs) you you know you've scrolled through oh i've got no potions left and it's like okay and like you're literally fighting for your life running around trying to pick up berries off the ground to heal yourself and it's that kind of chaos and um, frenzy that just makes it such a unique game i think and the way that you know you're running around this area maybe you're trying to take out like a thunder jaw and if you run too far you venture into like another area and oh crap there's like five charges over there and charges aren't like a difficult enemy but when you've got your attention on like a thunder jaw mm-hmm. or a rock smasher or you know there's so many cool uh machines in this game it's like, oh no, what have I done? And then you're just like, I'm screwed here. Um, and you, you always kind of tend to find a way out of it to, to survive or whatever. But yeah, it's it, there's so much that can go on. It kind of reminds me of like um, when Far, I think it was like Far Cry 4 came out and it was one of those games that was like set in a world where there's just so much wildlife. They kind of dialed it back with like Far Cry, Far Cry 6, I think. But that was the kind of thing where, you know, you're in an encounter with a lion and then like a an eagle swoops in or, you know, there's just anything could happen. And it felt like that in this game too, where um, there's just so many different ways to engage with the world and the enemies and the enemies with each other. It, it's, um, yeah, it really creates some special moments like that. 100%. And um, on the topic of those near-death experiences and then yeah, bringing this perfect crescendo of I'm fighting this thing and now I've kited it into this other group and now it's all at me, what was the, the Valor charge that you were using primarily? Because I, I was on normal and I was getting slapped around a lot. I was using the the sort of the overshield one and because I, I needed yeah. it a few times where I'd be out of berries and then you've got your, you, you know, your reserve berry pool you can pull from and then once that's gone... <laughs> you're screwed unless you roll around and, and find some on the ground. But having that overshield, it was a few times where I was like one stray slap or claw away from dying so many times when I got that last arrow off or that last shot off just in time to give me victory. Did you use that or did you use one of the more um, attack-based Valor Surges mostly? At the start of the game, because I, I focused on the warrior tree, it was the, I think it, it gives you like better critical damage and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. 
but once yeah once i noticed that there was that shield one i did use that one to kind of overclock your health and i definitely used that in the the very final boss encounter a lot like uh, i relied on it by that point and a few other times in the game so that that was certainly like that that's what you want from i think like a special move or whatever is like yeah. a bit of uh, a bit of backup you know you can get ones that give you stronger attacks or um you know you can craft more quickly or whatever it is like you can put traps down quicker it's like no nah, I, I just need to not die here one of, one of the ones I wanted to try but never did was the the one that allowed you to go invisible. Oh, I didn't even the notice that. The full cloaking ability. Yeah. yeah, I never used that. But I just loved when you pop that Valor ability, you get that unique animation for each one of the abilities where Aloy's putting, you know, when the she's, pulse. you know, becoming a, a super a super archer, she, she slams the face paint across her face and you see this visual like level up of the character or the overshield is like beep, boop, boop, like yeah. pressing like these hand buttons and it's like it's so cool and it just adds this layer of just slick polish mm. awesome science fiction radness where i'm just like Fucking yeah let's go <laughs> like i was so excited every time yeah that that's a that's another cool point is like you mentioned the face paint there's so much so many outfits and costumes and customization with the face paints and stuff in this game that um you know, it's not the kind of thing where you can piece by piece customize Aloy's outfit, which would be cool if you could be like, you know, I want to have this headdress and this, you know, um, upper body and this lower body or whatever it was. But yeah, it, it was cool to see that much variety. Like there's so much that, you know, you go to a vendor and they're selling something and you kind of look at the stats and you're like, yeah, I don't need it. Like I don't, you don't need to buy everything in the game and you probably can't afford to buy everything in the game and that includes the weapons too yeah but it's just those armor sets too they're so pretty especially when you start making your way out of the the greens and blues into the purples and the oranges when you Mm. get into those legendary and epics they're just so cool and then the fact that you can dye them and just make them your own in a way like yeah it'd be awesome if you could re-socket the boots, the gauntlets, the headpiece and the chest piece. That'd be cool. Maybe in future games they might, but this is a cool step in the right direction at least where you go, you know, I love the look of that, but the color palette sucks. So I'm going to go to to this tribe and I'm going to dye it with some plants that I've plucked off a mountaintop and boom, now it's all black or boom, now it's this color combination and it's just awesome. Yeah. It's so good. It's so good. JP, maybe we could bundle like, I've, I've already sort of gushed about the graphics enough i think and how i feel that this is the true next gen step forward mm-hmm. but maybe we could bundle in sort of the graphics with that music and sound and overall presentation into one here and yep. i'll throw it over to you to lead us off yeah like there's not much more to say about the graphical and presentation side of this game i think there is a stunning amount of detail in this open world in everything yeah it's it's the it's the level of detail you expect from a linear game really like when you play um the last of us or uncharted or what's another example i don't know (laughs) god of war i guess like because there's only so many locations to go through and they know that you're going to walk through that corridor and through that office and through that you know um village they can throw all that amazing detail in there. But in a game like this, they have no idea whether you're going to venture through that forest to find that shelter or that um, <clears throat> little rock cave or whatever it is. and uh, Or even just like the, the way that ter- the terrain is laid out like a real world with um, bushes and rivers and like animals running around and butterflies and what's underneath the water when you dive into a river or into the ocean like there's so much there and Mm -hmm. it's the amount of detail you'd expect from a linear game the way that you move through the world so quickly um it's it would be so easy to miss as you're you know either gliding through or you're on the you know on one of your mounts that you've um summoned it's easy to like speed through all that and miss it and I, i kind of like Far Cry 6 was a a recent game that almost looked as good as Horizon when it comes to like the scenery 
but uh, that game even repeated a lot of its assets. I felt like, you know, you go into a um, cabin and it's the same kind of 12 things in there that you'd see throughout the game. I just felt like everything was so unique and, and beautifully done here and just handcrafted is, is how it feels. Like it, it feels like it was made with that in mind. Like they didn't want it to to feel like that. Every village you go into feels completely new. You're never going to feel like, oh, this is familiar. I've been here before. Um, they all feel different. They all have, you know, they're all set in different level, like elevations in the, in the cliff sides and the mountains. And it's just all so unique. Like every town has like a, a cool little setup um, and it's just makes them interesting to explore and to find the different people who sell things and that's something that it's it's easy to just if you haven't played it to just be like yeah sure but when you've when you've actually seen it like it makes sense doesn't it it, it really does like going through these these biomes and seeing these different tribes and yeah their, their garb looks different and like you, you go to like you touched on far cry 6 which yeah was visually stunning but you could almost copy paste every second enemy you come across using the same outfit mm -hmm. the same face the same character model where this you walk through these these villages and every character looks unique from a facial perspective, at least. They might be recycling some of the same maybe costume-based assets on some of the more ancillary people that are just existing. But yeah, you go to the vendors, they all look different. They all speak differently. They'll give you different facts or bring up different topics. And just the sheer amount of diversity represented in this game, like the way uh, African-American people are shown in this game from a visual perspective even like um some of the asian cultures that are showcased in this game like the detail in the hair and the skin tone and the coloration on their lips and their mm. eyes and everything about them there's so much detail and care put into that like what well, i think you said you used it like homemade i think was the term you used ha a second handmade, ago handmade yeah handmade yeah and that's what so many of these tribes look like they're they're unique in their own representation and aesthetic and the way they talk and their beliefs and it's just done with such a high level of care and respect which i adore mm. and i think it's really great and just seeing the amount of positivity on social media which is typically a cesspool <laughs> like seeing seeing people of color gush about this game and share screenshots about like look at this this is this is the best you know highest level of detail i've ever seen of a person of color in a video game before the the way the way they look and act and interact and speak and it's just really really phenomenal work by gorilla and everyone else involved and uh yeah tip of the hat to everybody for that yeah. because it's uh it's so pretty that, the machines are diverse looking the yeah. world's diverse <laughs> the characters are diverse diversity is probably another good word to uh quantify this game in some regard definitely like the random npcs that you just are able to talk to like you know there's the big npcs that become like part of your party or that give you a quest but then there's you know there's the side quest and then there's the smaller like errands which they call for more like a fetch quest or something that's a bit simpler and even those people that you talk to you look at them and what they're wearing and the face paint that they have and their hairstyle and their jewelry. And you're like, that would have taken someone like months <laughs> to, to yeah. work on. Like it's uh, And there's hundreds of people yes. that you meet in this game like that. So you can only imagine the human hours and the energy and the effort that went into this game. Mm. And it just blows my mind. Like Yeah, it's not just like a dude in a hoodie and a bandana. It's like the most intricate, like chest chest yeah. pieces and feathers and like paint and it's it's just so much it's it's special special game design and yeah it's it's stunning in every aspect of the game that word stunning is another one that would just mm. describe the game and its many sections and varieties everything is stunning and gorgeous and i want more of it so bad so bad yeah i i don't really have a ton to add on the sort of the soundtrack and the music like there were some big moments where I think it married up really well with this big score coming in and adding more weight to to this this emotional payoff. But 
yeah, some some more variety would have been nice. I liked that we did get constant running commentary from Aloy. She was very self-aware of the world around and observing things when you walk into new areas or like the weather changes that I touched mm-hmm. on earlier. Like it was great to have that constant uh, heartbeat or that constant pulse from her as far as there might not be anything going on right now, but Aloy's got something to say and it's brilliant because it breaks up the silence and, and keeps things interesting. Yeah. Um, we can kind of segue this into the next section as well, which is the spoiler-free nitpicks and gripes. I, I thought the music was really fitting. Like it's a kind of a mix of like, a, I guess, tribal instruments with like modern instruments, like bass guitars and that kind of thing. Um, very fitting. I did find it repetitive. I don't know if it's just, I just always, every time I thought like, oh, the music, like and thought, actively about what music was playing i noticed it was the same song that plays when you're exploring something Mm -hmm. and i'm thinking to myself like is this song playing constantly or am i just noticing it because of the song that it is but either way i I felt like it could probably have done with more variety because it's an open world game um or moments of silence where there's no music like you don't need to have music playing constantly um you, t- you mentioned like Aloy talking so much. I-, I noticed on the internet, like a lot of people don't like the amount of self-talk that Aloy does where she's talking to herself. I think it was great because I do that. Like it's relatable. <laughs> I'm like, this is this is what I'd You're be doing. Also crazy. I wouldn't be doing it with as much flair and amazing athleticism on display, yeah. but I would be narrating the same way she is as I'd be walking through here and dealing with all this mm. nonsense. So you you do talk out loud to yourself, do you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't do that um, really, but I understand why Aloy does because she was raised as an outcast, essentially. Like she kind of grew up by herself, I get the sense. So, you know, it makes sense for her to be that kind of person that's just always just talking to themselves. But as like a gameplay mechanic, I love that she tells me where to go and what to do when I'm doing a puzzle because to get to a nitpick some of the puzzles in this game are really frustrating and not and not intuitive <laughs> at all um, they're clever and they're complex but they're too clever and complex like I just did one where I knew I had to move a crate and you've got this cool um, tool in this game called the pull caster where you can latch onto something and like pull it towards you And I was doing it through like a gap in a fence and the gap, like the the distance from the crate was, I don't know, maybe like four meters away and it wasn't working. And I couldn't figure out how to get this crate to move because I couldn't push it from the other side because it was stuck. I knew I had to go back to the other side and it turns out I had to look up a video. I was standing too close to it. I had to be not four meters, but like six meters away from it for it to register. I know the exact one you're talking about. Yeah, man, that was that was a frustration. And she's given you hints, and like there, there's these really cool areas, the vistas, where you're trying to like line up a a um, hologram with something that was there in the past. And she's giving you these hints, and I'm like, I'm standing exactly what where you're saying, and that the hint isn't helping. So it's like I would almost go further with, with those hints that she gives and and add some more detail. But that could just be an issue with um the puzzle design and I was listening to sacred symbols today and, and like Colin Moriarty was saying like those moments are an example of like how much budget they had to put into this game because presumably they watched people play, play test the game and saw where they were struggling. And they said, okay, we need to explain what's happening at this point. We need Aloy to say, you know, Oh, maybe I can jump over there from here or maybe I can glide to that area. Mm -hmm. Um, and and those without those clues, yeah, it would have been impossible because even with the clues, it was often really hard. <laughs> yeah, some some of those puzzles and some of those relic areas, they were very, very time consuming. And yeah, some of them were unnecessarily frustrating mm. because yeah, Aloy almost talked in broad riddles herself yeah. as far <laughs> as explaining the next hint. So I, I had to YouTube a couple. Yeah to work out how to get from point A to point B a couple of times as well. So I feel you there. As far as nitpicks and gripes from myself with Spoiler Free, like one one you've mentioned that um, was a bit of a bugbear for me as well was 
the over aggressiveness of Aloy's hair. <laughs> like, uh, you know, it, it felt like she was never too far away from a high powered fan <laughs> in some, like the hair look, looks luscious and amazing. When they had the sensitivity as far as hair flow for a, environmental movement at say a three it was great but most of the time it sat like around a nine so she'd turn her head and it's like this mane just flying <laughs> everywhere like medusa almost like yeah. it, it didn't kill the game but there was a few times like come on just settle down here come on please yeah it, i'm having an emotional moment had here it's, had it's a life of settle its down. Own sometimes it, it's like she'd just turn her head and the hair would just like jump um, yeah and the hair looks really cool it just doesn't look like it's um connected to her in the right way sometimes like it doesn't you know i've never had braids like that so maybe they're rock solid and they just they do move like that but uh yeah it it's it's definitely i think i feel like it's the kind of thing where someone must have given feedback like oh her hair needs to move more yeah like well you you think you think maybe five years ago could even be potentially less i don't know but you think of like hair in previous gens where it was just like almost like a piece of lego like long hair was just yeah. stuck down went down past you past the the people's collarbones and they'd turn and it just wouldn't move at all it was just this one solid lego piece so seeing it go from that to hair mechanics in mm. in this game and other games now it's, it's a big leap yeah. but yeah just just grab that slider and just hold it at a three yeah it doesn't need to go up because yeah it gets a bit wild yeah i also like as far as issues with those especially with those puzzles, like there was some areas of climbing and jumping that didn't always work properly. Like this, I'd call it like the stickiness of the climbing where you feel like you know where to go and it doesn't work for whatever reason. And it's just like, you're not quite hitting it in the right way. Um, or there'd be a jump that you have to do and you think, Oh, I can make that jump. Like other times where I've needed to jump, I've jumped like 10 meters. And it doesn't seem like realistic at all, but I know that's where I meant to go. So I'll just do it. And it wouldn't work. Like there was, you know, there's these, these drones that fly around that you have to mm -hmm. catch as a collectible. And there was one in particular um, in a forest. And I'm like, yeah, I can easily jump to that. That's what I meant to do here. And I'd fall short every single time. And I had to get higher and glide down to it, which took a really long time just to catch it because I couldn't figure out the right way to do it. And that's that's frustrating. The cauldrons kind of are similar to those um, uh, old ruins where I enjoyed exploring them. Well, the cauldrons are cool. Like the concept of the cauldrons, it's fascinating. They always just felt like 10 minutes too long. They always had like, okay, I'm about to do the thing. And then another problem pops up and you're like, far out. Just like, let me get to the big fight. I know there's got to be a big fight. There's always a big fight. Uh, you're just putting it off longer than necessary, um, making me jump through all these hoops to kind of pad it out. And it just wasn't necessary. I felt like they was they were interesting enough without wearing out their welcome. Did did you feel like that sometimes? There, there was a couple in particular that felt like they went for twice as long as some of the yeah. other cauldrons. And, and I'm happy they weaved in some of the cauldrons within the mainline story. So it yes. lessened the need to find them outside of the, the primary uh, narrative you're trying to, to work through. So that was that was nice because yet they are such a long undertaking. Like it's the only only sort of thing you do in the game where you get a get a message pop up and saying once you're in here there's no there's no turning back like it is a long long mission or quest or whatever you want to classify a cauldron as and it could take you potentially an hour maybe two depending on how difficult it is and also then how big mm. like it is a big time sink to get through one of those things and yeah it didn't feel like the juice was always worth the squeeze <laughs> at times because it was the same the same monotony over and over. I like when they changed the dynamic up and there was the submerged areas yeah. you had to, d to deal with in one. I thought that was a little fresh wrinkle. But outside of that, it was just running around the Matrix. Like I was waiting to walk past Neo and Trinity in those pods in one of those areas a few <laughs> times. It's like an Easter egg or something because it's very real world Matrix, not like the the cool suits and the bullet time. It's the shaved heads plugging into the into the <laughs> machines with the creatures coming at you like it's that's what these cauldrons are yeah. just prettier and less less deathy oh probably more deathy actually yeah I, I just love the contrast of the cauldrons to the you know lush open worlds but yeah just just a bit too long so 
hopefully that's fixed in the sequel if we get one. But um, like you know, the only other thing that I'll mention is I did have just a couple of game crashes. Um, one of them was when I think the world or God or the, the PlayStation itself was telling me it's time to go to bed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was like I was I was trying to get like the full stripes in the last hunting mission. Um, to to get the trophy for for getting a stripe in every in every hunting mission, and it was it was one where you have to um, oh, what did you have to do? You had to yeah, I, I can't remember what it was. Anyway, uh, it was taking me a very long time, and I it, the game just crashed, and it was like go to bed. So I went to bed, and I lay in bed and thought about how am I going to beat it tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> which speaks to what you were saying at the start of the podcast about like how much this game gets in your head. Um, so as much as that's a nitpick, um, you know, two crashes in for me about seventy five hours is pretty good. Um, there was I had one, yeah, just one, one total. Okay, I, I did notice, or I have noticed more recently, like when you go to a new area and the name of the area pops up on your screen my screen would go black for like one second as it kind of oh, okay. processes it, um, which isn't like great because you, you're sitting there going, "Did my is my game about to freeze or something? Um, but it sounds like that hasn't happened to you. No, it wasn't wasn't noticeable from my end. Like the, the main thing that I saw was just like texture pop-ins sometimes where the, the camera draw mm-hmm. distance could only go so far. So when you're traversing, you'll just see certain details pop up as you're going into certain areas. It wasn't wasn't sort of immersion breaking or whatever, but it was noticeable a few times, especially when you were airborne. You'd sort of see see that more often than not. But my my other nitpick, it wasn't to do with like a performance thing. It was well, maybe it was my own performance mm-hmm. actually. Was some of the fights you have with with these machines, like I'm be you know, sliding underneath their legs and rolling and dodging. But it'd feel like no matter how big and bulky and slow some of these machines were, they could sort of hit me from any angle. Like whether they're shooting projectiles or swiping or jumping, they could sort of jump and almost like turn midair as I'm rolling and sort of move their whole body 90 degrees that way. Like stuff that felt like it was physically impossible sometimes where I'm like, no way, I've avoided this, but no, nah, it's like whack, I'm down and then I'm rolling for berries or hoping <laughs> I've got a, check, a chance to heal. Here. Do some berries. It's like, there's no way I dodged this. And they're like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. I got you. I'm a big giant woolly mammoth, but some old, oh, not woolly, I'm a big giant mechanical mammoth, but somehow I managed to jump and smash you even though you move this way. Yeah. Now, I think the next one that you've got on the agenda, we should move into the spoiler list, which probably gives us a um a, a good time to say this is the spoiler warning. Let's go into spoiler territory. The forbidden, I like, the forbidden, I like that very the forbidden much. Forbidden west so, of the podcast. Nothing is forbidden now. It is all on the table here. Full spoilers ahead. That spoiler uh, <laughs> that you said to move into here. Uh, like it, I guess it's it's almost a favorite moment at the same time. Yeah. Like if we wanted to jump in and talk about some of the things that stood out sure. the most with this game, uh, and and one of the most memorable things for me because I am a a big dinosaur nerd, and seeing the Claw Striders, which is Horizon Forbidden West's interpretation of the Velociraptor, meeting these things, then being able to override them and then ride that as your mount was so goddamn cool. Like, I felt like I was in Dino Riders. I felt like I was living my childhood fantasy <laughs> right then and there. But then the fact that this Claw Strider just moves at, like, a very slow canter was a bit annoying. So that's sort of, like, a, a spoiler wrapped around my favorite moment. Like, mm. I loved that interaction. And I loved how terrifying they were because you watch them and they were moving around in packs like raptors and whatever they're else. so quick. Like they're hard to, you know, you want to exploit their weak spots. Those ones are hard because they're just moving so quick, even in slow-mo. Exactly. But then you ride the damn thing and they're like, no, we're not going to move quick anymore. <laughs> we're just going to coast along. You know, we, we've worked hard to get to this point. So now we're just going to power walk you from here to the point. Like, so that was a bit of annoyance. But yeah, dealing with these packs of mechanical raptors and they're quick and they're aggressive and then there might be like an apex variant in there that can just run rough shot through you like it's was terrifying and and you could copy paste that moment with the the claw strider with just about every interaction especially the first time interactions with new machines 
like where you know you meet like the giant ass bears or or the the tremor tusk or the the spinosaurus equivalent later on in the game those moments we're just like holy crap this thing is huge do i have enough time to scan it with my focus to actually work out it? oh no it's just stomping <laughs> on my face right now i gotta try and run away because i don't know what its weaknesses are and it's so good like it's big action set piece moments those first time encounters and even the follow-on account encounters afterwards but those first times you meet or reintroduce yourself to a thunder jaw or whatever else it just feels like hollywood box office stuff and i'm all mm. for it i've got some other favorite moments but i'll throw it across to you as well to uh you know maybe we can bounce back and forth a little bit on some of these because we've got some shared faves i think as well yeah like i mentioned earlier about how the narrative like the main narrative of the game was a little like left me a little wanting um but as i kind of sat down to jot down some favorite moments i'm like okay there's actually quite a few going on here um the first i think the biggest moment of the entire game for me and probably for a lot of people is the first time that you come across the the zeniths and yeah. beta it just goes full <laughs> science fiction space opera yeah mic drop jaw drop what the hell yeah. moment and it was so cool that's the that that is the biggest twist of the game and it happens at the midway point i'd say you fight against eric who whoops your butt and you can't damage him and you can't even um yeah you you, you can't put a scratch can't on do him, anything really. yeah. you, all you can do is avoid him and that is such a cool moment um, because you're in shock as you're doing it. You're like, who are these people? Why do they have another clone of Elizabeth with them? What are they trying to do? I had like, it flashed through my mind. Like, did I just travel a thousand years into the future? Like when I walked into this, you know, cauldron or whatever, what's going on here? So that moment and the confusion that surrounds it is unmet in the rest of the game i think the next biggest thing would probably be the death of val um as he yeah. tries to protect beta uh, in another cauldron area and also the, the yeah, and eric kills him the son i of know bitch. That, that guy that eric um and, but then also like the, the tribute to him that you get later on back at the base um that that made me cry really i i cried there like that moment where Quick, very condensed backstory with Val as him and him and Zoe become a become an item. They're from two separate tribes, two separate worlds. They really bond and develop a relationship. Val dies saving Be- or trying to protect Beta, and then when you when you're laying Val to rest, Zoe says that his memory will live on because she's pregnant. And that moment there just killed me. It yeah. killed me. And then the touching moment where they're outside kneeling and praying and singing mm. to, to sort of the shrine or, or the, the grave where Val is, is buried, it is stunning and it is such a beautiful moment. And the fact that you can go back there anytime and sort of have conversations with him in, in a roundabout kind of yeah. way, you know, like oh, it's just Aloy monologuing some more and whatnot, but it's so beautiful and it's got so much heart, that piece. And it got me good, JP. It got me teary-eyed as like no one's business. Yeah. So I think those two are the big emotional, not, well, they're the big twists, I guess, in the game. The big, like, I did not expect that moments. The third one, which is probably the most significant to the gameplay, is the first time that you uh, corrupt a Sunwing and the whole world opens up to flight and you're just like, oh... They've like I'm I'm glad I didn't know this was in the game because it's a complete game changer. Um, the the ease that that makes traversal and traveling, it's the best. In the end game is so good. Um, and so much quicker to to clean up some of the the, the missions. I just did a mission today, and they were like, "Oh, I guess you're gonna have to climb all the way up there to find whatever." And I'm like, "That's okay." Yeah, you just like on whistle the ducky and fly up there. So good. And the animation when you when you summon the the Sunwing and Sunwing up. comes and picks you up and throws you on its back in this one motion, then you and you're away. It's so goddamn cool. Yeah, it's awesome. The Sunwing is such a, a cool thing. It took me a while to learn how to take care of it. It kept dying on me, so I have to keep going back to like one of their nests and 
corrupting them. But um, the one I've had now, I've, I've had for quite a while, so we're getting pretty close. Um, I wish you could name name your uh, cool. your mounts or your yeah. pets. That'd be awesome, and and customize them. Yeah, maybe that's for future. Or I'd love maybe. that DLC. So so they were, I think, the three big main story moments. Um, unfortunately, I didn't think like the ending, which we'll get to later, had any kind of like twist or like it did have a twist but it wasn't it wasn't like a, a, an amazing one and there are some other moments that i want to talk about but i'm gonna throw back to you so that you can talk about some things it's not just me yeah no like like it's you, you're hitting similar beats like that that big reveal in that cauldron where you, you meet the zeniths and yeah you're like who are these futuristic flying impenetrable humanoid gods right now like what is going on and my mind went so many directions as, as to how this is going to play out. And I don't know if we just say sort of how they fit into the piece right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, we're spoiler territory, so... Yeah, like, so, so they weren't they weren't actually from the future. They were from 2060 and from pretty much faked their death and have been travelling the universe for, for a thousand, like, 2060... Yeah, a thousand years, they say. Yeah, a thousand plus years on the run from something which we'll talk about in more detail regarding the ending but yeah they're, they're just people like people like us asterisk i guess you could say jp obviously set 40 years from where we are right now but over years and and, and science and medical advancements they just worked out how to de-age and then it got to the point where they just didn't age and then they evolved into these human gods really like they had powers and and you know they had the ability to fly and they had all this crazy technological advancements that just made them some badass mfers and that whole thing blew my mind because it was primitive like pr prior game all primitive concepts in you know in the 31st century no real technological advancements and then you get halfway through this game and it just felt like they just turned the world upside down and it was just like what is going on what's happening am i playing the same game and same as you i'm like i thought for a second and i'm like am i gonna end up fighting in space am i gonna go to space here am i gonna have the the final battle on a spaceship or on another planet like what's gonna happen my mind went into overdrive with that but then um yeah obviously introducing and, and seeing this relationship build with beta who is another elizabeth clone mm. so you could say that um you know aloy and beta are sisters uh, and you know that's how you see that bond develop over time so seeing that bond develop and that respect and appreciation and understanding of one another develop over time at first Beta was just pissing me off. I'm like, you're carrying on over nothing. Just pull your head in. Aloy's got this. Just listen and get on board. But she's like, nah, she's defeated. She reckons the there's no way to to win. And mm. yeah, and I, and I guess so too from from seeing these futuristic humanoid god creatures with laser guns and whatever else. But seeing that relationship develop, seeing the relationship that Aloy has with her crew at the base develop, where in between missions you can go back and and talk to them more and sort of eke out further developments in the relationships that are building, not only with you and Zoe or you and whoever, but then also seeing Zoe give you feedback on how she's been react, um, liaising with Erend and stuff like that. And just, just seeing this little micro world build, you know, you, you, you I guess your extended family outside of, um, you know, the late great roast is gorgeous to see. And it's just really nice subdued storytelling so i love that and i love seeing that vulnerability and that realness in aloy and the game's just great the yeah. game is just so good it was one continuous favorite moment for me like that's a a bit of a cheat answer even though i've just been waffling for the last five or ten minutes but overall the game was just one continuous favorite moment i love this game Jono, so much <laughs> yeah th that base area as much as it annoyed me having like the circular setup with a million different rooms that I could never find mm -hmm. the one that I really wanted to at that particular time. Um, but that room with having all, all your friends in there and seeing them get their head around the world and learning how to use the focuses and just and like learning about the ancient, the old ones and the, the technology and the, the culture that we have in our modern day was really fascinating as I, 
alluded to like previously like seeing Aaron discover like metal and <laughs> and he's rocking out it's so good <laughs> and seeing like the others uh, discover the different things different rituals and and customs that we have in our world now oh, they, they they were talking about like holidays i think was one of them that was somewhere in the game where like oh people used to go on vacations and stuff and it's like yeah like it's it's interesting and fascinating to see <laughs> the, the world that we live in through someone else's eyes that doesn't understand it and I, I love seeing them because they're going through what Aloy did in the first game in like a you know kind of a speed round to 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 get their heads around like the technology and yeah. the way that and it, and it really humanized Aloy as well like they could mm. understand why Aloy was the way she was yes. and thought about things in a certain way or, you know, was so dismissive when people were like, oh, it's a god. And it's like, no, it's not. It's just a computer program. Pull your yeah. head in, you know, and then they chuck their focus on and they're like, yeah, I get it. I get mm. it. So it was really nice to see them get on some common ground and really bond yeah. as, as people. And, and without actually seeing those characters interact with each other, you get to talk to them about each other. And and like like you know when you first walk in there and talk to say Aaron after you've recruited, um, you know Zoe he'll say something about how she's like you know a vegetarian or like she's a weirdo. Or mm-hmm. They're talking about the Tanakh um, as like they you know drink people their enemies' blood and like they just have these like racist stereotypes of each other's tribes that are just broken down as they talk to each other. Um, which is a, a great kind of allegory for where we're at in the world, I think, um, as the barriers break down with communication. And um, yeah, just seeing them become a team. And as you go into that final mission, and it's really like, you know, Ocean's Eleven, basically, like you get the heist team together and Silence is there. And like everyone just like, let's let's go. And we've all got a, a role to play. And that is a um, that's a cool thing to to kind of see Aloy with a with a squad, so to speak, and with a family. Yeah, thank you very a, much. A <laughs> What's the line from Fast and the Furious? I don't watch those movies. We're we're family. Oh, it's yeah. you, you don't have to be blood to be a family. Uh, I think, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I, I think don't know something like that. I'm parapha- paraphrasing Vin Neither Diesel, of us but like it's... those movies. Um, no, but, but yeah, it was yeah. it was really nice, and those moments were great. I think. I don't know if you'd classify it as a moment, but like just the the amount of swagger and weight that someone like Carrie Ann Moss and Angel, uh, Angela Bassett brings using the voice work. Like it annoys me that Regala was front and center right to begin the game with, but then outside of that, she takes a backward seat in a similar way, like with how silence is treated yeah. and probably go into that in more detail with, with nitpicks and gripes and stuff. But hearing... Angela Bassett, like Hollywood heavyweight, and also Carrie Ann Moss. And it's funny because I talk about the Matrix a lot, and obviously she's Trinity in this, and she plays Tilda, one of these uh, people from from the past that think we think is the future god. And uh, you know, she gains a bit of a conscience and, and struggles because you know, spoilers, she was heavily in love with Elizabeth, so she sees a lot of Elizabeth in Aloy. And it's the best version of Elizabeth. So she sort of wants to side and work with them to ultimately dethrone her crew. And that sort of, in essence, uh, creates the the final act as far as assaulting the, the Zenith's base. But yeah, those just hearing those voices for the first time and seeing, especially the likeness with Tilda and uh, Carrie Ann Moss, like her likeness is utilized in that. I don't know if Regala is using Angela Bassett's likeness, but she's certainly using her big, booming, powerful voice. Yeah. Um, the the twist with with um, with Tilda in the ending, I guess we'll get to that later, but um, she certainly, yeah, the performances in, in the game all around were fantastic, I'd say. Um, it's, it's Ashley Birch is on yeah, fire. Ashley Birch playing both Beta and Aloy. There's moments where I'm like, it's the same voice. Wait a second, is it the same? Yes, it's the same because she played them so well in the sense of like Aloy being confident and Beta being kind of like insecure and wounded and traumatized by her experience being somewhat of a, enslaved by the Zeniths. Um, 
and not having any like freedom or choices in her life and and seeing like from the storytelling perspective of those two it was it was really cool to see them contrast against each other exact same dna exact same person in in some ways but completely different because of i guess the nature versus nurture side of of their experiences mm-hmm. um so yeah it'll be, it will be cool if if um beta exists in the next game to see how far she's come, whether she's picked up a bow and learned how to fight for herself and, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to to look forward to. I feel like after the first game, I remember playing through it and getting to the end and not really knowing, like remembering the names of the people that were supposed to be important to you because, you know, it is so much it is such a long game and it is there is like so many characters but in this game i feel like i have like remembered like all, like especially all those party like we haven't mentioned alva i don't think i was i was going to bring her i love she's, her she's, she's great, so yeah. <laughs> adorable and she's you know she's an adult female but like she looks at everything through such an enthusiastic sort of childlike mm. lens and she's just so happy to be there with Aloy all the time and going on these adventures, but then she's also terrified in some of the situations you put her into. But she's she's just such a different energy yeah. compared to to Val and some of these, I guess, more hardened tribal warriors and leaders that that come along come along on the ride with you as well. Yeah, yeah for sure. I've got some like moments that I'll mention in like the side quests and that kind of thing that just stood mm-hmm. out to me. Um, f- I mean, this wasn't a side quest, but finding Beta for the first time, like when she joins your party, was really cool because it was pretty unexpected. Um, when you light up Las Vegas, the, the that was such a cool it's, moment. It's really cool. Um, I was a little bit disappointed with Vegas to begin with because I was like, oh, like uh, knowing the city for the first time um, going into the game, like I've never been to Denver. It's hard to tell in the first game, like which parts of the world are uh, which parts of Colorado. But in this, I was like, okay, Vegas. Like, I know generally what that looks like. I'm expecting to see big skyscrapers and everything. And you get there and like the whole city's underground, basically. And I'm trying to figure out like, how does this even work? I guess it's some kind of global warming effect that everything's covered in sand now. Um, but it was more returning to the area so first of all it's underwater and then you drain the water and okay we're in a big shopping center casino kind of thing but when you go back there for a side quest which i just did before recording today that was when i was kind of like oh like this is really cool um it's lit up it's popping it's it's what you'd expect vegas to look like to a degree yeah. it, it just confused me the fact that it was like underground i guess and that was one of the I guess it was almost it's almost a frustration but it's just it, I guess it makes sense with the world that they're building is that nothing is really recognizable from our world like even you get to San mm. Francisco which you know it's a city that we both know we we met in San Francisco um you recognize the Golden Gate Bridge and then for me after that it was like nothing about this tells me that it's San Francisco Part of that is like... Yeah, everything else is very nondescript in these places, wasn't yeah, it? Outside yeah. of that one big monument where you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that one. Hey. And maybe if you live there and know it like the back of your hand, you'll recognize different buildings and that kind of thing. But for me, it was like, oh, like, I, I, I can't tell the, you know, the things that I think about in San Francisco is the slopes, um, the really steep streets. And I'm expecting to see heaps of buildings that are shaped like the you know, the CBD of a city. But instead, it's like the coastline has eaten a large amount of um, the shore because of, of mm-hmm. I guess, rising tides, global warming, blah, blah, blah. And that's a good way to kind of avoid making it realistic to what we know. But at the same time, even when you're like exploring underwater, I'm not like recognizing anything. Um, no. And I, I really wanted them to use the Golden Gate bridge for something i thought that would be a cool set piece to use but it's just you know you can fl- it's just, it's in just the distance. there and you can fly over to it if you fly too far over to it it says turn around um so that was i think a bit of a missed opportunity to play with some of the the things that we know 
about the cities, especially, um, especially San Francisco. But you know, we got Pelicans. <laughs> we did. We did get a lot of Pelicans, and it, and it felt bad, like having to kill so many innocent, cute animals <laughs> for resources to level up pouches and things like that. But you know what the. The future is hard, yeah. you know. You, you it's kill or be killed. So uh, pelican, get out of the way, otherwise you're gonna end up being an expansion for my health capacity yeah. or something, you know. But <laughs> yeah, may, maybe maybe we'll get more San Fran in this alleged future DLC. Maybe, maybe that's where it could really open that up and make it feel a little bit more relatable and be like, yeah, I was I was there. This is familiar. I, I crossed this section yeah. or there's a building I know. It's just like even even the streets and the buildings, there's like rocks that have taken over and it's just completely unrecognizable. Like you never just see like the shape of a building that looks like something you can identify. Like you have to, mm-hmm. you know, occasionally there's like an old ruin that you go in and you're like reading around like, oh, this used to be a hotel. Um, but I guess it's maybe that's what just happens after a thousand years, and it's not anything to do with the the choices of of the design. But um, yeah, yeah. I, I'd say maybe yeah, maybe they spoke to some sort of you know environmental scientists, and they sort of said this is how these locations would look in a thousand years based off these global disasters that are going to happen with the uh, the zero dawn situation not to so, mention yeah. um i guess san francisco is like it's a fault line and there's meant to be like a big earthquake there at some point that's going to like wipe out the whole city or whatever mm. so it, it it could have had multiple earthquakes that changed the elevation of um of of the of the area the other mission i wanted to mention was the hot air balloon so again back in vegas i just did this today so it's fresh in my mind but it was i I thought it was cool that you know you go into the um you go back into the casino you have to get this part of this dragon statue that shoots fire you give it to the guy and he takes you up in the hot air balloon and usually that would be the end of the mission it's a nice payoff it's a nice bit of um introspective reflection and you get to look out at a nice scenery with the holograms all you know shining in the in the sky and they're having a nice little conversation and i'm thinking like okay that's a good kind of just like ending to the mission but then a big storm comes and then a big storm bird knocks you down and you have to fight it and um it's it, it turns into something that was unexpected even at that point in the game you know i'm at that point 60 70 hours in so i just love that like to use that as an example of how much the game keeps you guessing how much extra they put in to those side things yeah definitely and and even even sort of the the side quest you do with like I, i'm just going to call them like the focus family or the focus team mm-hmm. your little crew at your base and having like the Catalo side quest where you go and find the componentry so he can make himself another arm so he can be more valuable to the yeah. team or where you're doing the stuff for Zoe and her tribe where you, you're you running around and, and curing the land gods like they see some of these machines as gods that help them survive and, and cultivate and farm the area so running around and nursing these machines which you're killing 99% of the time, you know, back to health because they're actually seen as a as a deity was was really cool and then the follow on from Zoe and then going back to her tri- like to her tribe, you know, let's say later in the game in the end game and you see all the farms are back and the crops are back and the tribe is singing a song and celebrating and and the machine gods are even singing a song back to it. Like there's just these beautiful little moments like that that are just uh, you know, so outside the primary scope, but you can just sit there and just watch these things play out and just be happy and feel real emotion because it's just little things they didn't need to do. They didn't need to add, like it doesn't really forward the primary plot or anything like that, but it just makes this world more believable, more lived in, more alive. And it was great. That part where you're pretty much singing with the Triceratops. Yeah. I was I was cracking up and smiling and so happy because it's like, bah, doing its little <laughs> song back to the tribes people. And it was so great. Yeah. There's, there's certainly a lot of special moments. Um, and it's nice to um, 
it's nice to be able to help these people who all have unique problems. Some of them, you know, they've their tribes have run out of water. Other ones, you know, that the, they're concerned about the um, you know, that what's happening to their their soil and their land and their food supply. There's there's so much nuance there and and the, the way that they you know i said before like they all have kind of a viewpoint of other um tribes and whether you're an outsider or whatever like mm-hmm. that it just makes the world feel connected the way that they have these preconceived pictures of you're, each other you're, you're for the most part just a nora savage for the for the majority of the game like oh what are you doing yeah. here you nora scum even if you were the the savior or the champion people still look down upon you because of those bloodlines yeah. and it's um yeah it's it's nice because there is a lot of social observations from this game that is very apparent today and sadly still apparent a thousand years in the future yeah <laughs> definitely yeah let's talk some um i mean did you want to talk about some favorite enemies or have we covered that already oh i think we could talk about them like that that first like fighting Thunder Jaws was cool because that's that's as close as you get to a T Rex. That first encounter with the slaughter spine I thought was really really cool. The big Spinosaurus guy that I guess rivals the uh, the Thunder Jaw or the the T Rex. Uh, but the other ones outside of just the the big gorgeous moments with uh, finally climbing to the top of a tall neck or that tall neck that was stuck that you sort of had to repair the and water? then yeah. you ride it back up through the cauldron. Oh, okay, like, yeah. Yeah, or the one in the water yep. was really nice. Yeah, like out on the coast of San Fran. But the other the other moments were when you're fighting the big giant ass grizzly bears, the, the couple of variations of the bears, they they were just about the scariest machine to fight in this whole game. Oh, and, and the slither fang, like giant ass spitting cobras that wrap mm. themselves up around buildings and what like they're very imposing but yeah the the big bears and then the slither fang especially because you you deal with your first slither fang really early in the game and it's a scary fight but just seeing these giant ass snakes that could swallow yeah, you in one it's bite pinned down as well for that yeah and it's still a challenge <laughs> yeah but then when you fight them later, yeah. especially when you fight them in the arena and they can cruise around freely and stuff, it's it's a scary fight. But there's so many varieties. Like think of every prehistoric creature that you've seen in Jurassic Park or read in a book. They hit the majority of the notes as far as prehistoric creatures. And then you get some some current day ones, like there's a there's a monkey equivalent. You've got Kangaroo. Um, or was that like sorry? a little wallaby kind of leap, the leap lasher. The the burrows, that's sort of like a meerkat in a way. Uh, so you get some sort of current day for us creatures and then you've got some some really cool prehistoric animals or cre- prehistoric machines that are just so cool to fight and interact with. And as you said, right at the start, you know, they all come at you differently or they all use the environment differently and they all have different strengths and weaknesses. So it's not just... I'll use my most powerful weapon, even though the old uh, spike thrower <laughs> does do pretty good damage. Um, yeah, you, you've got to have a bit of strategy and a bit of tact with with each type of enemy that's coming at you. Yeah. You got any favorites, yeah, JP? I, yeah, I had a few favorites. Um, anything that was just massive was always fun. Like you've got the big triceratops looking thing. you got the big um, elephant looking thing. Or I guess it's a mammoth, I don't know, but going by. Yeah, the big tremor tusk. Yeah, like the first time you have to fight that in part of the main story was pretty cool um and it hit hard it's got too so in much first health run. as well like there's the different like the kind of the cannons that are set up around it and you like try and like hit it and run around and like you you, you, you kind of like push your luck for as, as much as you can weaken it with the um acid or whatever and then you try and hit it with the, the cannons and take some health off and then you try and hit off one of its guns to use against it but you know, to pick that gun up, you got to get real close and risk like getting swiped by it. And, and then one other thing with those guns, like when you when you disable these machines' weapons, like they've got infinite ammo when it's attached to the <laughs> machine. But when you pick it up, it's like, yeah, here's twelve bullets or something. It's like, come on, <laughs> come on, where's the rest of the ammunition here? But I get it. It's gonna keep keep the pace and the the heart rate high so i get it but it was a bit frustrating sure sometimes the, the size of them they have like internal ammo somehow yeah <laughs> you'd think so right yeah. 
No, no, I'm saying the machines have like an internal ammo, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, like a feeder. Well, there is like ammo packs, like tanks on the back yeah. of a lot of the big ones. Yeah. But so I think my favorite, what, what's the dinosaur that swims in the water? P- plesiosaur oh, the, or something? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a plesiosaur. Yeah, yeah. So fighting those ones on land was always um, a fun challenge. Um, the, the way they kind of like swirl water at you was, was... It was really hard to avoid that attack. I kept getting knocked down by those water yeah, jets they're, so often. They're pretty much... It's the, it's kind of like the returnal thing. Like you have to dodge at the right exact right time and you kind of become like a little bit invulnerable when you dodge. Um, and then I think my favorite was the big, the massive turtle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the shell snapper? Yeah. Is that that it, one, was, it was a turtle... But it was massive and it was quick. So it wasn't slow like a turtle. And it would dive underground and then just pop up right underneath you at the least convenient time. So that was always um, challenging the way it would spit ice at you. And I did like the wide more, I think, uh, like the, the hippos. hippos where they would like, you know, spit the rocks at you or whatever it was. Um, and I love that they were pretty much like pooping out resources yeah. that you had a certain time to pick up before they <laughs> before i guess they became rotted or out of date yeah, like know. the poo became bad <laughs> yeah but there's just i just love the way that everyone and they, they suck up like they have like a vacuum effect as well mm-hmm. where they like bring you in it's just fun to have some so, so much variety of appearances but also um they just it's so inventive the way that they attack and interact so differently with with the world i, I never played monster hunter so maybe like I, I know some people were talking about like that being i guess the go-to example for how a boss can interact with the world and be so customizable but the way that you can like pick off so much of their armor and their abilities mm-hmm. by targeting them and exploiting like explosive sections um and and their behaviors as far as like i know that they're gonna come this direction so i'm gonna put a trap there the way the slither fangs interact with the environment by like wrapping around like a, a column or of rocks or something it just seems so um like like such great ai involved in it yeah. and that's yeah. really impressive to me i never played a monster hunter like i said but for me, it's the first time I've seen that kind of boss fight in a game. It was super cool. And just, yeah, like the AI for a lot of the, like the bristlebacks almost being a glorified truffle pig at times where you'd use it to sniff out resources in the environment. And yeah, every one of these machines was so unique in how it came at you and how it interacted with the environment. And they were all scary in their own way because it's hard to remember the attack patterns and the movement patterns of Mm. 43 (laughs) machines. So you just got to hope for the best sometimes. And yet seeing their pre or like their prearranged paths when you use your, your focus is one thing, but once it's go time, that's out the door, you know, (laughs) They're, they're coming at you and throwing everything at you. And like those leap lashes, like when it first attacked me, then it had like a big like energy whip mm. that it did swing out. It's like, what is this? <laughs> Where did this come from? How come I don't have an energy whip? Like, yeah. what is going on here? And even the the red eye, what like the watchers from the first game, which were basically like the Goombas, like the the most basic enemy. When, when they show up in this game, they've got a really powerful ranged attack that they can shoot at you that can really knock you around. So. And when they're the apex levels yeah. of those as well, they really, really slap you so down. There's like, not really anyone apart from maybe, I guess, the charges and the grazers that you can just completely overlook. You kind of have to keep an eye on them. You have to um, kind of take your best guess at which part of them might be um, a weakness or vulnerable. And um, that's always that's always a, a bit of a hit and miss. <laughs> it's like... a is this one of the ones I can headshot? No, it's not. Okay, I guess I'll aim for its um, shiny bits. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or, or exactly. And then, and then outside of those standard Earth-like machines, we did get a couple of like these futuristic, sentient, mechanical, octopi-looking things known as specters, which was a whole other ball game to tackle. And, and they were on the back of the situation 
with the Zeniths. Mm. This was a Zenith creation and seeing them things come at you and the speed that they move at, uh, they can do some real damage to you. Yeah, the last boss fight with the uh, the Spectre, the Prime, Spectre Prime was a real interesting battle. Um, just having an enemy that you haven't seen at any point up to then keeps things challenging. Um, I thought it was a good way to to kind of end the game with, with that kind of fight. I think so. So I guess... Yeah, if we sort of shift towards the ending, did you mm. want to? Did you want to give us sort of the the condensed, sped up version as far as yeah. maybe loose spoiler notes that get us to to the ending? Oh, uh, <laughs> I'll save the synopsis for you because I actually had a hard time processing a lot of the main story <laughs> in this game. It's such a long game, you know, seventy hours of of yeah, you know trying to absorb information and, and when it comes mm-hmm. to the sci-fi stuff i'm like okay these guys are bad they want to take this thing we want to take this like i just take like the main like the dot points so some of it i wasn't completely across um I, i'm more into it for like the like the emotional moments and, and they're the things that yeah, i, I yeah. felt were lacking compared to some of the bigger heavy hitters in playstation kind of um catalog but um, yeah, I thought the the final mission was a great coming together of your team, getting silenced to to kind of join you. Um, then you got the twist where Tilda was actually a lover of Elizabeth, and you felt like that might be a reason that she was wanting to help you. But then she turns on you, um, which was you know just a cool little thing. But it wasn't like a mind blowing like I feel so betrayed kind of moment for me um i thought the boss fight was was fair i thought the actual ending with silence deciding not to take off into space on his own he kind of ha- showed a bit of humanity like what's the what's the point of going out there by myself like what survival's not the only thing that yeah. there is like like he, he's been by himself for, for years and years it feels like obviously well before uh, Aloy meets him in Zero Dawn. It feels like he's always been a bit of a, a sort of a solo, yeah. solo fella living a very isolated life. And it was nice to see him finally, I guess, throw up his arms and go, you know what? I'm done living this. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick around with the, uh, the, the Focus family here and uh, see what we can do. You know what? It's the power of friendship because he see, he yeah. sees Aloy with all her supporting cast, and he goes. The big robot has a little tear in the corner of his eye, and um... I've I've got to say, like, <laughs> as far as like, did we sort of skim through? We haven't really talked nitpicks and gripes. Did we talk, want to talk that first before or a week? Because we're already talking. Let's talk about the ending. ending, and then we'll close with the nitpicks and gripes before our final words. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So as far as the the super condensed play by play as far as what's happening with the story to get us to the ending obviously yeah the game set 6 months after you've defeated Hades Aloy has been hunting for a backup of Gaia which is going to reverse the effects of the planet's degrading biosphere you find a, a Gaia kernel but the other pieces of Gaia are missing so you need to then go find uh, Aether Demeter Poseidon so on and so forth to combine them with the Gaia kernel to to jumpstart the uh, biosphere healing process, you could say. So that's the main storyline. But then on the back of that, you've got the, the, the isolated Tanakh tribes that you're trying to win over. Uh, Regala was one of the main generals of one of those mm-hmm. tribes. She disagreed with how they were doing things. So she's broken away to sort of create this rebel tribe that is planning to destroy Chief Hikaru and everybody else. She's that's voiced by um Angela Bassett. So so she's a bit of an imposing force. You you have a showdown with her later in the game. Did you spare her life? I killed or her. Did you kill her? I killed her big time. Oh I spared her. <laughs> Why? Because she comes with you in the fight like she wants a proper warrior's death. Yeah, she and doesn't deserve it. Well, she gets it because she gets killed by about a thousand spectres. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so, and that was like, that's a gripe that I'll that I'll touch on more in a second. But I spared her life, so she rolls out with me into the sunset in that final mission. Mm. But yeah, you're hunting for these additional kernels to combine with Gaia 
to rebuild the earth for all intents and purposes, to, to stop it from degrading and becoming unlivable and everyone dying. But then on the back of that, you run into these zeniths, which were people from 2060 that have become, yeah, immortal humanoid gods. Uh, they've got an Aloy clone named Beta who they're trying to utilize to grab Gaia and, and prolong their life because what you find out near the back end of this game is the reason you haven't really heard of heard from them or seen from them in a thousand years is because they got so smart and high in their own technology, they got all the consciousness of the, the Zeniths and put it into an AI and then the AI become angry and sentient because it, they locked it away for years and years and years. It broke out and now it's on a warpath to kill everything and everyone. So it's been going from like planet to planet, finding the Zeniths, destroying and wiping that planet. The Zeniths narrowly escape. Next one, next one, next one. So they've finally gotten back to Earth. And then they find out that the Nemesis is on a collision course with Earth to destroy the planet. That's where, like Jono mentioned, that Silence was going to cut and run in the plane, in the spaceship. Mm -hmm. uh, he decides to stick around with Aloy to try and work out how they can prevent global destruction and the death of humankind. But yeah, Tilda, who sort of did the, did the swerve with the Zenus because she's yeah still in love with Elizabeth after all these years gave Aloy an ultimatum. It's like, get on the ship, we're going. Nemesis is here. Aloy says, stick it up your ass. I'm not leaving my people. Then you have the big battle with the uh, the Spectre Prime. So she jumps into a giant like Hulk Buster type of Spectre Prime suit. You kill her. She dies and, and it was like, second she's dead, there's no real speaking of it after that. I thought like she'd fall out and you might get a one last little monologue from Tilda to Aloy, you know, I'm sorry, I did it for love or whatever, but it's like, no, nah, you're dead, moving on. Let's let's work out how to save the planet from the nemesis. And that's where the, the credits start rolling after there. You're, you're having a bit of a powwow with the team. Silence is, is in the fold with, with the rest of your band of misfits. And credits roll from there as you're flying off on a sunwing as the credits roll for like 17 days. <laughs> so I guess um, really... They didn't fix any of the problems that they set out to fix in this game. <laughs> they've just bought themselves some more time yeah. because they said, like, well, they've got Gaia back now and they've got Gaia beginning to terraform Earth and, and fix that biosphere. So in a roundabout kind of way, they, they achieved the goal, but they didn't plan on Nemesis, the big sentient AI, hurtling towards Earth to kill everybody uh, because they thought, we've done it. The world's saved. Happy days. Let's have a... Let's have one of those horrible futuristic ales that Aaron seems to love that tastes like cat piss. But instead, now they've got a, a sentient AI to fight. So maybe they do end up in space eventually, JP. Who knows? Who knows? Because the ship's still there. It is, isn't it? It's big enough for a couple of people. Um, yeah, so what did you think of that ending? I thought it was like the, the epilogue where they showed everyone was really good. Um, like... You know, th showing how everyone had progressed or where they were at or, you know, the, the mm -hmm. effects that Aloy's had on, you know, maybe we didn't save the world, but we did save these different tribes who were at, you know, odds and conflicts and um, kind of at each other's throats before we showed up. I, I loved it. I loved the ending. I thought I thought the, ba the boss battle with Tilda was a little rushed and a little bit weak, to be honest. I, I smoked her pretty quickly, okay. like... Once I worked out a couple of the moves that she had on rotation that were coming at you, like we talked about it earlier, I just cheesed her with explosive spears and <laughs> and other, you know, high volatile instruments of death that I was carrying. So it was very sudden and I wanted a little bit more out of that. But the lead up to that, like seeing seeing the battles where you use beta's smarts to hack hack the I can't remember the the creation, the exact word that they called the creator. So it was building all these machines coming through. And then there was a war between the Spectres and the Zeniths and all these machines. It was this old versus new yeah. big like beastie battle, which was playing out and it was so cool. And you're having like these little guerrilla warfare moments in between. So the lead up to that final battle was awesome. But then the final battle was just like, oh, okay, fair enough. That's cool. I'm happy, but... Could what level more. were you by that point? <sighs> Close to 50. I think I was probably more 40-ish. So e even yeah. on easy, it probably took me, I don't know, between 5 and 10 
attempts before I could get it right because it would take a lot of health off with some of those attacks, um, especially when it got close and started to kind of melee you. It would just, mm-hmm. just knock you around and almost like even though I had it set for my berries to automatically heal me, uh, once my health got to a certain point, even then it would just kind of like wipe you out. But um, That's why I need to use more of them traps, JP. Oh yeah, should have done that. Traps, 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 traps. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's definitely opened the door wide open for a sequel. Or at least some very big DLC. Um, but yeah, did you want to do nitpicks and gripes or least favorite moments before we close up? Yeah, definitely. Like um, what I mentioned there regarding Regala, like her and Silence, like Silence especially, like you've you've got a lot of familiarity with him from the first game, and in this, you have an interaction with him at the start, and then it's crickets for like 40 plus hours mm. of the game until you deal with him again. And I know you, you smash the right. smash the focus that he was hacking in to, to listen and know your plans, but yeah. there's nothing. Like Lance Reddick is an absolute beast of a human being and Silence is a great character and they didn't utilize him enough in this game. So that annoyed me a bit. Yeah. Um, I feel like there was a middle, like you, you had some interaction with him in the middle somewhere. But yeah, it wasn't certainly a constant presence like he was in the first game. That's for sure. Yeah, and and it certainly sets the table for him to obviously be a lot more involved in the third game or the fourth game or the next big block of DLC that's coming for Forbidden yeah. West, whatever. But I feel we're going to get more silence, which, which I'm happy about. Uh, yeah, Regala didn't get much, much time to sort of flesh out her character outside that she was just a uh, hungry for blood and and wanted to kill everybody and was the ultimate warrior and like you said you killed mm-hmm. her after you beat her in the in the big arena siege i spared her so she comes along for this big battle and there's a couple of cool moments where you're fighting certain creatures and some of your other focus family of you know fighting just out of shot or you see them up on a ridge line so you get some cool little moments with her but she's silent through all of it really like there's no additional back and forth there's no real interactions with her and then she ultimately sacrifices herself and dies a hero's death fighting all these specters to allow you to to continue on your quest quest which was nice but they didn't flesh her out much and that was a bit of a bit of a missed opportunity i think, I think that's because lots of people like me would have just killed her so they probably saved themselves the effort of investing too much time into voice acting that half or at least half the people won't hear. I don't know. Yeah, like that makes sense. And no doubt Angela Bassett might have cost a bit of money to like, I don't know if she's done many video games. This is the first that comes to mind for me. Like she's a she's Hollywood heavyweight on the big screen, but... This is my understanding of her first major foray into gaming, so it probably would have cost Gorilla a little bit to get her involved, but that might we've got be a good amount reason. of Carrie Ann Moss. That might be why uh, Lance isn't in the game too. Yeah, budget constraints. Who knows? <laughs> Doubtful though, because everything else is done with such a high level of polish yeah, and care. True. I doubt they would have said, we need 20 more lines of dialogue from Angela. It's going to cost this. And they're like, sorry, too much. Like... I don't know. No, that's a fair point. So, fair point. So that was a gripe. That was a gripe. I wanted a bit more fleshing out and a little bit more touch with with Regala and Silence. Um, that difficulty curve was very real in parts, especially when you're trying to to do the hunting grounds like you touched on and fighting your way through the champions to fight the Enduring. Mm-hmm. Some of those champion fights on normal, it felt like I was playing Elden Ring where <laughs> it's like one shot and Aloy's down. And it's like, what the hell, man? Like I'm doing the combos as you tell me, but it's, they're blocking everything. And then it's like one big attack. And it's like, oh yeah, I I yield, you know, or whatever happens. Obviously yeah. you don't fight to the death with those people, but God, I fought the, the second, second and third ones in that a couple of dozen times wow. i reckon to to beat him it was tough sledding i think it was like the the second last one is the hardest by a long yeah. shot and i got to it and was like i'm coming back when i finish the game 
I came back when I finished the game and I was like, I'm coming back when I'm level 50 because it's still wiping me out. And I had done everything except for that mission as far as like getting the platinum trophy. So I was like, okay, I'm level 48. I'll go back and I'm fighting him. And there's another person in the ring with me attacking him. And I, I'm like, uh, who is this person? And they're, they're like taking, he's taking damage from them and he's like trying to hit them so I can go up and attack him from behind and do heaps of damage. What? And I beat him in like 90 seconds. Like it was <laughs> the easiest fight of anything in the game. And I don't know if it was like a glitch based on like the quest that I'd done like just before going there or something like that. But yeah, I had some extra help and it made it <laughs> really easy. <laughs> I had no help. I had the opposite of that. I had just punishment, punishment, punishment. And it was so like I had to I had to take a break. I, I went through a loop where I tried to get him yeah, ten or fifteen times in one hit. Like I didn't do I tried to do that before I finished the game. So I was trying to do that in like level thirty ish. Yeah. And it was tough. I got him eventually and I felt like a god, but I chipped away at that over a couple of days. It's, like uh, I didn't do it in the one sitting. It's tough sledding without the spear explosive spears, isn't it? And, and limited am, um, arrows too. Like you only get like a dozen oh, arrows. The arrows don't do anything that? unless you unless you hit them with your um yeah, like with the resonator. Yeah. Like they do one damage or something if you just hit him with a regular shot. So yeah, yeah. So that was that was tough. Like that curve on those, and then yeah, you touched on the hunting grounds as well. Some of those challenges were just pff, get stuff, mate. Like this is ridiculous. So the curve where it was like. Feeling good, feeling good, feeling good. Impossible. Feeling good, feeling good, feeling good. Impossible. Like, yeah. I get it. And it's, it's saying go level up more and progress more. But there's just a few times where I'm like, I am doing that. And I'm still feeling very weak. Some right. of the hunting grounds instructions as well were way too ambiguous. It's like, you know, three strikes and then hold down for a power strike. And you do it. And it would be like wrong input and it would like restart you. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? Like I'm doing exactly what I think they're telling me to do. Um, so that was yeah, really some, frustrating. I, I button mashed one of those like where I was just frustrated and couldn't do it. And I was like, you know, to hell with this. And I'm just hitting it angrily. And then I did it somehow. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, cool. I'll take that. Yeah. Anyway, um, what have I got on my list? So something that we both can probably agree with is there's a lot of rebel camps and so many rebel there's camps. so many and when you have to find them all for the trophy it's like okay where are they i'm flying around there there there's another one um but i took the technique of just searching for the rebel leader and then killing them and then legging it out of there which worked often but then sometimes you got to loot their body you got to get a key you got to go unlock the chest and then you can hike out of there occasionally you get like not just the rebel camps but the outposts and in those they're much bigger and the leaders often like behind closed doors or something so it was really hard to find you really had to like kill everyone or, or stealth around to do it and at that point in the game i was just like not feeling it really it's not as exciting as fighting robots i guess um so that was that was a, a small nitpick. And, you know, when you're 100%ing a game, whether it's this or Spider-Man, you get to that end game point where it does start to feel like a grind, but that's just the way it is. Um, as far as, like, clearing out the map, I didn't love the decision to have us retreat to find all these metal flowers and fire gleam and areas that you were coming across organically in the beginning and very early yeah, in the game in the too. beginning of the game even like underwater areas that you were told to explore in side quests at least with the metal flowers and the fire gleam alo would say like oh i don't have the tool for this yet and then you knew like okay i guess i'll be coming back here but i was swimming underwater looking for a door or something and i'm like this, I just can't do this yet. So why would they give me the quest if I haven't got it yet? Oh, I, I guess the underwater breathing tool is 
really close. And then it was like 20 hours later. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Great quest line. Like that's on the back of the Vegas yeah, quest line. You get that. But, oh man, I just wish that they, like they, they basically went with like a Metroidvania kind of approach to an open world, which isn't necessary to me. Like the world's big enough that you don't need to do that. Um, I think that they, I don't know. It, it it makes sense to have the same puzzles everywhere in the world, but um, I just think it could have been done in a way that you didn't feel like in the moment you're like, oh, do I need to remember this spot and come back? And then I guess later you realize that you don't need to go to every single one of those things, but some of them you did need to, like you'd be exploring a ruin and it's like, this is a collectible. I'm here. I'm doing all the puzzles okay, I've been doing this for 25 minutes. I'm at the end. Oh, I can't blow up this wall. I guess I'll be coming back in hours if I remember yeah. it or whatever. So that's that's some things that I possibly would have done differently um, or I would have liked to see, had to have seen done differently. But um, that, that's like we're nitpicking and griping at the moment. And that's basically all I have that I haven't mentioned already. Oh, it's it's not really a gripe or a nitpick, but I'll say one thing that took me by surprise was the uh, explosive radius of the fire gleam. <laughs> there was times where I felt like I was standing well away from the uh, the blast zone, and I'd still get clipped and then either get knocked off an edge or, you know, in some of the certain areas where you're doing a lot of traversal and climbing and whatnot, there was a certain certain door in in an area where you had to use a fire gleam and you had to climb your way up there and i i felt i was standing enough to the side of it to avoid it but not nah, boom knocked me all the way back down so i had to navigate all my way back through these ruins and climb this pole and you know mount, angle the camera that way so i can jump backwards to this and you know like it's that was my own annoyance yeah. and i guess lack of caution towards the the blast but yeah that fire gleam it hits it can it can throw you and it can hurt you <laughs> yeah yeah definitely i i guess looking at it from that aspect is the the nitpicks and gripes that we've got aren't anything major like nothing's game breaking nothing's destroying the narrative we're not here beating up on the characters and lack of development we're not saying the control scheme's horrible like this game is perfect in many many ways like you're saying it's not perfect top to bottom and, and i can i can appreciate and acknowledge and and uh you know reiterate that point as mm -hmm. well but overall the experience you get in this package is second to none and it's so special and as far as the the last word i guess for from our respective thought processes here is yeah like like i said i said right right near the the jump of this podcast where it's like is is this my favorite game of all time right now quite possibly yeah like i'm trying to avoid recency bias Jeez, uh man. but it, it is up there as one of probably let's say it's in my top five of all time yeah. let's let's say that i don't know where it fits in that scale but as far as bringing all of my favorite things together and chucking it into that blender I've I've drunk this Horizon Forbidden West <laughs> smoothie and it didn't upset my tummy. I'm feeling refreshed. The taste was delicious. I want to make another one. Please, Gorilla, give me another one of these smoothies so I can drink it because it's such a special game. I'd say 100 million percent. It's 8-bit approved. It's going to go down as, like, at least for me right now, it's game of the year for me. Like, we've still got more games on the way, but mm. it's going to be very, very tough to beat. And um, it's just, this is this is a universe and a franchise that was made for me. Like, Gorilla have snuck in while I've been sleeping and stolen my thoughts and my feelings and made it into a video game. And I loved them for it. I'm a bit creeped out that they did that. But at the same time, thank you, because it's just... Mm. everything I could want more. That's great. I think you only played um, Zero Dawn through once. Do you think you'd go back for like a new game plus on this one? Uh, to be honest, probably not. Like, because I'm very much with, with big open world games. I just love that experience. Mm -hmm. I love that first time experience and seeing this story unfold for me like i wouldn't lessen the game if i went and did a new game plus and i think it 
would add some some new interesting wrinkles. But for a lot of these big narrative titles, I'm happy just to have that first run through front to back, feel it fresh for the first time and have that as my longstanding memory for it. But but maybe, like never say never, there's not a ton of games coming out this year. So maybe <laughs> come mid-year, I'll, I'll get a bit hungry and hankering for some more Horizon and, and go back. But yeah. for now... I'm happy just to have that singular experience and just live, let that memory live on forever. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll give it a couple of years, a few years maybe, and then perhaps go back for a, a new game plus. Same as what I did for Horizon Zero Dawn. I, I like the idea of having my explosive spears for the entire game and just destroying machines and enemies from the get-go. Um, I don't know if it means that you'll have like the swimming tool or... Access and, and the sun. I don't the think they'd king. give you the sun wing straight away, yeah. right? They couldn't because it'd break, it wouldn't break the game, but it cheeses the game a lot. It, it that's does for sure. cheese it, and that's so much fun to cheese. So, my, my, my last word on Horizon Forbidden West, I've written, Would you look at that? And that's because I was doing a side quest before, I'm just cleaning up all the side quests, and there was one where you find this guy who's been wounded, he's been blinded, and they're trying to get him basically supplies to to leave his tribe because they're going to kill him because he's no longer a warrior and um it's a great little mission where eventually he ends up joining the plain song tribe and getting a new you know role you know new way to live there he has to leave his family behind it's really emotional but throughout that um mission there's a sequence where you come across a river and you have to swim across and the character's like oh i hate water you know let's let's get in the water and because i'm playing in the end game you know i'm coming back to a mission that i skipped i just summon the old sun wing (whistles) jump on the sun wing to fly over the water and one of the people that i'm meant to be swimming behind goes would you look at that and i'm like they programmed in dialogue for if you come back here with the the flying bird at the end of the game to acknowledge how crazy it is that you can fly on this machine and just skip a big section of the traversal and i was like that is such a cool bit of detail that they thought of and it just speaks to me how special this game is and how much Mm -hmm. thought and care and just attention to detail they've put in here Um, it really just sums up something that makes this game special me so that's my last Definitely. word is like would you look, would you look at, that? at that i love like, that would you look at this game it's just it's everything that you that they've done here it's just like just look at this thing it's just such a marvel to to experience and we've been talking about it for two hours and 15 minutes already there's nothing that i can't say that we haven't already said just go and pl- I don't, you've, you've obviously played it if you listen to this but um you know tell people out there to go and play it because they really need to experience if you have a ps5 and you haven't played horizon there's something wrong i think like if if you don't intend to play it maybe it's not your thing even like even like i know ali make it your thing god yeah like like some people just aren't into big open world games if you're not into big open world games that's totally fine but if you're gonna try one you gotta try this game like there's so much to love here even if you just run around and do the side quests and pick flowers and... And take photos. Yeah. Like, my God, the photo mode is so special. And it's, it's funny, we didn't mention it at all in, in any type of spec, uh, specificity, but the water, the water mm-hmm. in this game is just about the best I've ever seen in a game. Yeah. And obviously getting the rebreather and being able to swim through it and stuff, but just seeing the water in the streams and on the shorelines and stuff, it is absolutely beautiful and some of the best water effects I've ever seen. But yeah, this game's special, JP. And I feel bad because this came out a week and a bit before Elden Ring and it was like Horizon Forbidden West was the crown jewel. Everyone was talking about it for a week and then Elden Ring is sort of rolled into town. Just like Breath of the and Wild. And it's just taken that jewel out of the crown and just flicked it down the stairs. Yeah, just like Breath of the Wild uh, five years ago. But, you know, you and me know <laughs> the real goatee. Amen. The... And like I've I've been playing Elden Ring a lot and I 
respect and appreciate and understand why it reviews so well, but I would take Horizon Forbidden West over Elden Ring 10 times out of 10. And that's not saying that the 97 out of 100 is not justified. I totally get it, but that game is not my kind of game. I'm enjoying it and I'm pushing my way through it. I've put 20 hours into that damn thing, but Horizon is my kind of game and it'd be more people's kind of game because it's so much more forgiving and it's beautiful in every single aspect of this game. And yeah, you're doing your PlayStation 5 a disservice if you don't have a copy of this game. Well said. Mm. All right, Ape Nation, that officially brings us to the end of yet another spoiler cast here jp thanks for stopping on by sharing your very clear concise well-structured insights you are certainly the yin to my very (laughs) erratic yang and it works very well obviously you can find the fantastic john opec at johnny himself on the socials you can find me at brendan 8 bit you can find miss ali hart at miss ali hart and you can find 8 bit as a whole at we are 8 bit be sure to rate, review, subscribe this podcast and all the other podcasts you listen to on the regular because those ratings and reviews help keep the emotional lights on in our hearts. If you wanted to uh, support us, you can do so monetarily over at ko-fi.com forward slash we are 8-bit for the low, low starting price of $1. If you wanted to shop our merch, you wanted to buy our Horizon-inspired merch design, you can get that over at shop8bit.net. But until next time, 8-Bit Nation been our pleasure to bring you this horizon forbidden west spoiler cast thanks again to sony for slinging the game our way but until then much love stay hungry would you look at that